No, listen, it was uh, the fact that I think people genuinely wanted uh, to keep the office of the Illinois Comptroller independent, right? Mm -hmm. There's constitutional offices, they're all independent from each other. And the governor, to the tune of close to $10 million, wanted to make sure that he could own the office of the Illinois Com Comptroller and guarantee himself a wingman instead of a watchdog. Mm -hmm. So Someone he had a wingman, say. now he's got a watchdog, and there's a big difference. Right, so like he may not like to hear what I'm saying, but like I say, don't take my word for it. Just go read the Constitution, and it's going to tell you whose job is to do what. And it's really simple. I, I, I do. Job you know, we're having fun with this interview, right? But like at I'm the end of the blast. day, me I, too. Are you having fun? I am. Oh, thank God. But like, thankfully, I don't drink because this job could certainly drive you to that. Because <laughs> I hear so many horror stories every day from people that are truly suffering. I gave a speech this morning and I actually started breaking down, so I'm not gonna do that right now, I'm focusing. Yeah, I mean, this being a comedy show, Good Evening being a comedy show, and talking about politics, uh, Illinois, we have a lot of fodder with not having a, a budget, but the human cost is serious. Like, you must have known that this was part of the job before you got elected, but did you know that it was part of the job? Yeah. before you got elected? Well, I mean, I, I had an idea, given that I was traveling the whole entire state um, and hearing people's stories, and that really kind of fired me up to, like, want to go and make a difference. Fast forward, though, to after December 5th, and it's like every day I'm just hearing, like, horror story after horror story or talking to people directly or, you know, just I really have a much greater even pulse on what's happening because now I get to pull the curtains back and see truly how big of a disaster this is. So who you have in these positions, more so than ever, I think it's important to have a person in the controller's office that has a moral compass, who's willing to not back down from a big fight, who every day I have to wake up like basically ready to rumble and it stinks because I'm like actually a really happy person that's super optimistic and positive and I get along with everybody. You talk about the moral compass. Yep. You talk about a fiscal watchdog. That's why. There are some people who say the office shouldn't exist because it would be easier, and we wouldn't have to pay you, not that you're being paid now, mm -hmm. but right. it would just be more efficient to not have the office at all. I mean, what do you say to that? Again, you know, you need a person with a moral compass. A computer isn't going to do that. If we were just having a computer do it, of course, a computer would be programmed to be efficient and just pay out as the bills come in. That would mean that folks like this woman would, you know, potentially just drop dead. And I guess from an efficiency perspective, you could argue the computer did its job. But this job, during moments of fiscal crisis, unfortunately puts me in a position to have to uh, work towards prioritizing and identifying who is going to be coming ahead of who in the line. I agree. I think that it should be a person in this office. And it should be office. a person with a moral compass. I agree. This human cost thing is no joke. It's a real thing that's yeah. happening. You must see it way more, obviously, than I do. Uh, but, you know, from a viewer's perspective, it can be very headliney. And I think the change that's coming now is this suit. I'll just call it the suit. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Um, so, what is the change that's coming? Do you think it's going to happen and why? Well, the Attorney General has just filed um, a motion to have the St. Clair County, which is the same county uh, court that had actually a year and a half ago, almost 19 months ago, uh, she had gone to court to try to get uh, a motion as to whether or not we were allowed to pay state employees when there was no appropriation because there was no budget. The law is very clear. It says that without a budget, I am not allowed to pay certain things, right? If there's no appropriation, no appropriation, that means no payment. No budget, really no pay. Clear. No, this is different. This oh. is no appropriation no pay. I that see. means the legislature decides how much money is appropriated for any line item. And in a budget that's been presented by the governor. In a budget that's been presented and approved, right, by the legislature. Then that gives me a legal appropriation authority to be able to pay the bills. So the attorney general was arguing at the time, because we had no budget, uh, that the state employees, unfortunately, uh, did not have an appropriation. So that because there was no appropriation, then I, as a controller, at the time it was my predecessor, should not be able to pay them because there, that would be in violation of the law. There was no appropriation. Can it I? wasn't because she's anti-state employees. Right. It's because you could argue she's actually in favor of state employees having some stability and not being, you know, used as pawns in this political game that the I, governor has been playing. That's right. scary. And then the, the judge ruled in favor of the controller 
who actually took the opposite approach uh, of the Attorney General and said we should continue to, stay, to pay state employees. But I guess the concept was 18 months ago that if it was absent an appropriation, the controller was violating state law by continuing to pay uh, folks that she didn't have an appropriation authority for. So that's why the Attorney General, who has to be compliant with the law, right. went forward and said, hey, we don't have this money. We shouldn't be paying these people. And then that puts pressure on the governor to actually get the job done with the legislature. Because nobody in their right mind should want to stop paying state employees and to shut down government. It's, you know, the longer people can go without feeling the pain, the longer the governor can go without fulfilling his constitutional and obligation and no blaming pressure. everybody else. There's no pressure else. on him. There's no pressure. And then on top of that, he backs up his message of that this isn't my fault, it's their fault, with millions of dollars in, like, you know, TV ads, radio ads, blogs, you name it, right? It's like we... The, the Democrats are being out-messaged by a billionaire, and well, I get and it. Well, speaking of message, I mean, I think, you know, this is just typical Governor Rauner is swinging in to save the little guy and the, and the unions. Because, of course, he cares, as you know, about right. state employees. No, of course, of, of course yeah. he does. He's, 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 he loves yeah. unions. Is that right? Oh, he loves them big time. So if he cared an iota of state employees in 2004, 15, he would have introduced a balanced budget proposal and actually helped to pass a budget. If he cared, you know, a smidgen in 2016, he would have done that again. Instead, he's basically used them as political pawns in this budget crisis. If he cared at all, he wouldn't even let this go to court. He would be back, instead of being in Paul Springs today, meeting with the Koch brothers. For real? For real. Hang on. Time out. Governor Rauner, the billionaire, yeah. who, but who loves unions yeah. and wants redistricting uh -huh. so everything's fair is in Palm Springs with the Koch brothers. You didn't know that? No, seriously, he is. I'm not making that up. He's been there yesterday and today. I mean, this is valuable time. He could be working behind the doors, crafting a budget proposal. Why is it that he isn't doing this? Why isn't he proposing the budget? Why isn't he making a budget? It's one of his only duties. Well, What's can, going on? I can only speculate, and it's because he cares more about his pet projects, the things that you talked about, like eliminating labor in this state, uh, doing uh, term limits, instituting fair maps. You know, I think these are all things that should be debated, right? I'm not saying don't debate them. That's yeah, what a democracy is all about, right? You have a good idea, or even if it's a bad idea, but you want to see it happen, you take it to the legislature, you file a bill, you work it through the process, and you put it up for a vote. But those things are completely unrelated to the financial strength of our state. And he says it's his growth agenda. No, it's not. For who? Like, I haven't Growth met a single debt. business. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. I'm hey, going to use that. Do it. I haven't met a single business owner. I want that 10 bucks, though. I got gotcha. you. Okay, thank I gotcha you. Eventually, as soon as they appropriate it. But um, I'll call my rep. Now, here's what I wanted to ask. You take all these tours. You go to these places all over the city. There have been studies coming out now that says there is a direct connection between the rise in crime, which is not making us look very good on a national level, mm -hmm. and the fact that we haven't had a budget for three years. Right, because it's Do a lack agree? of investment. It's a lack of investment in um, infrastructure, but most importantly, in human capital. So, you know, he can plan, put the blame on whoever he wants. It's never about him, right? It's never this issue that it's not, he's we rich. as a state are not investing enough in these poor communities. It's, uh, it's somebody else's problem. Yeah. You know, it's a failure from, you know, the mayor or whoever else he wants to put the blame on. But he's maybe if the state was actually paying its bills and investing in uh, preventative progr prevention programs, investing in uh, homeless shelters, uh, investing in working mothers, investing in these things that actually give children hope and parents hope, struggling uh, neighborhoods hope, um, that might actually lead to a reduction in crime versus seeing the spike that correlates with, you know, his tenure in office. So things have never been easy in this city, but it certainly doesn't help when our own governor is trashing the city of Chicago every chance he gets. It's like, who in their right mind thinks that's a good idea that as a leader of this state, you take every opportunity you can to bash this city? When, when the mayor was trying to get, you know, uh, sell bonds, he came out like the day before and trashed the city of Chicago and said that he was going to basically take over the state or the uh, CPS system, which completely drove up the price of those bonds. Because I mean, that should that be like... Drew, that drew uh, Moody's to downgrade yes, us and all that. I don't even and know that was just how that's the city legal. Of Chicago. That's the city of Chicago just trying to fend for itself. Yes. Pay for itself. And stay instead afloat. of having the governor try to help in that effort to get a bond at the, you know, at the, the best interest rate, he is actually tanking the deal and then going and talking about, you know, what a mess Chicago is and how, you know, 
things are going south. It has nothing to do with him, right? He literally interfered with costing us hundreds of millions of dollars potentially in this bond deal when he should have been helping. He was hurting. I, I don't even know how that's legal. He should have a, a an obligation to help the city thrive versus actually be part of the reason why that interest rate went up. Well, you know, I don't think that Governor Rauner has his finger on the pulse of the city um, or the state or the, you know, average American. But I would love to have him on the show, first of all, because, I mean, I think he might have mentioned not too long ago that some Chicago public school teachers were illiterate. Do I have that right? Yeah, you do. And it's unfortunate because... I would argue that they can definitely read the writing on the wall, as can all those kids that have not had investments done on their behalf. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's terrible. It's insulting on lots of levels, but really, at the end of the day, it all boils down to we can choose to invest in kids, we can choose to invest in teachers, in education, in higher ed, lower, K through 12 higher ed, early childhood, into uh, people that need medical services, or we can you know, drag this out for his pet projects, and that's really what this all boils down to. And if he were out amongst these people, I think he would have a little more of a mandate to speak in such a manner and have a little more of a finger on the pulse of what's actually happening with these cuts. Yeah. Not cuts, we don't have a dang budget. Um, Bruce, we'd, we'd love to have you on, but you write the budget first, and then and, and we'll talk, and we'll talk. That's the game. Um, so, I mean, now what? Uh, obviously, well, you know what, even before I do that, and I don't want to do this, but I'm going to. You know, if only there were some larger stage politically where we could have, uh, you know, an attorney general that is being told to go against uh, the laws that are being written. If we had someone who was in charge of a, I'm talking about the president. He's writing these executive orders. They don't really match up with actually what's being done. They don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of relates to the way Governor Rauner is not writing a budget and telling people how to run things without any money. Um, the Attorney General of the United States was just asked to step down last night as we last filmed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this suit is happening. Um, is this a national trend? Is this something that we can fix here? You know, I think that people get overwhelmed. Again, when we talked to Schakowsky last week, I said, people are getting overwhelmed. Things are happening every day so quickly. But I'd really like to bring people's gaze back to what's happening locally. I think they can have more impact, and I think they mm -hmm. can actually see what's happening, too. Um, do you have any tips for the average viewer out there about how to get involved and how to solve the problems here in their state, in their city, in their town, in their county? Yeah, I mean, don't just be a spectator in this. Democracy is, you know, a, an active sport. And I think that if people let all the bureaucrats and the folks who really don't have your best interest at mind make the decisions on your behalf, then that's, you know, it's on you. Like, I can only do so much. And I want to advocate for the people that I get the opportunity to advocate for. But it would certainly be more helpful to me and anybody else that cares about this state if people would actually learn about what the job descriptions are for everybody and then hold them accountable, right? Like, I'm the chief fiscal officer for the state of Illinois, yet I also see myself as the chief accountability officer. And that means truth-telling in a way that brings accountability to what all of us are supposed to be doing. But the people are the ones who need to hold us accountable. We're accountable actually to them. But if they let us get a pass at not doing our job, then whose fault is that, right? So I'm going to come out and I'm going to speak truth to what I think is happening. But it would certainly be more helpful to me if other people, instead of just watching this show and saying, yeah, well, all right, well, cool, whatever, like actually pick up the phone, call the governor's office, tell him to get to work. Put his number you know? in your phone. Yeah, put it in your phone, send it to all your friends, tell them to call and tell them to get to work. And, um, and actually educate yourself about how this process works because I think, like I said, for last year and a half, if you ask nine out of 10 people on the street whose job it is to introduce the budget proposal, they're all going to tell you it's the legislature's job. Right. But the Constitution says otherwise, right? And so it's a enough, Constitution again. Yeah, enough Every like time. subterfuge or like mudd muddying the issue. There's a lot of noise out there. If you get rid of all that noise, the Constitution is really, really loud and crisp and clear as to whose job it is to do what. I think they chose that language deliberately. I think they put a lot yeah, of thought into that I don't that think document. it was a mistake, so... You know, if only there was some show that, like, people could watch, like, easily, like, on the internet or something that would, like, interview, like, local yeah, civil servants like, and, like... like, Good Evening with Pat Whalen. Oh, I don't know. That oh. would be cool. You just say, Have a Good Evening to the camera? Have a Good Evening with she, Pat Whalen. Do what she... Oh, say it to that one. To that one? I mean, have a good evening with Pat Whalen. Although I think it should be a great evening with Pat Whalen. You're not the first person to say this. 
You're super active on Twitter. Yes. Uh, it's updated. Uh, it, it lets people know what's going on. Um, real quick before we wrap up and talk about how people can stay attuned to what it is that you have going on, your office is doing, uh, to talk about the suit that we were talking about before yeah. about state employees, uh, Governor Rauner actually reached out to you in a very public way, shall we say? Yeah. Um, well, through his attorney. Oh. Yeah. Well, he's very personable like that. His attorney, not the governor. Yes, right. So what do you say? So basically, to show, it was a long letter. I'll share it with you if you want to read it. But um, it basically, I'll sum it up to just say that they said that even if the attorney general succeeds in her motion, which would be a motion that would then acknowledge that I have no appropriation to pay state employees. You're not able to pay state employees. Right, that I should ignore that court ruling and continue to pay state employees because otherwise it's basically on me that I'm the bad guy. So for all intents and purposes, the chief legal counsel is asking a separately elected constitutional officer to break the law. I'm not going to break the law. I mean, who does he think he is? Like, he's not above the law, the governor, and neither am I. Who do you think he is, the president? Well, I'm just saying, like, there's no chance that I'm going to break the law because he's trying to bully me into doing that because it works to his advantage. Like, he doesn't care about state employees. I do. He could end this and never even has to go to court. Just do your job and introduce a balanced budget proposal. Work with the legislature in good faith to pass a balanced budget. And then I get to do my job and pay the state's bills in a timely fashion. And I can actually tell these people who are hurting day in and day out that we're going to be there to help them get through this and that Illinois will get out of this fiscal mess. So there's a lot of things. I have a lot of plans. I'm going to work on a legislative agenda, offer some solutions that we'll be announcing in the near future as to how we think we can lend a voice to helping the state, you know, be more fiscally sound and manage our money better, uh, pay off our debt better. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's limited what I can do. The governor was elected to lead. Right now we've been leaderless. There's still a chance for him to fix this and to get to work, even if it's two years too late. But it's never too late, right? right. So let's get to work, all of us. And, um, you know, I can go from being his biggest critic to, you know, somebody who says nice things about him and believes in what he did this year. The office but is so built far for I that. haven't seen that, you know? The office is built for, hey, I mean, no matter what's going on. Yeah. Um, we're going to stay tuned to that here on the show. And I think we're going to have something for our audience to do to send a letter to uh, the governor's um, humble abode, I'm mm -hmm. sure, and let him know that we'd like him to pass a budget. But in the meantime, uh, well, our next show is here, by the way. It's at oh, Steppel. great. Nice. It's in March. Cool. I got a, I got a I ticket come? for you. I totally you can totally it, yeah. come. I'm sure you're busy, but I mean, you know, it'd be pretty cool to be like, oh, well, that's the comptroller's seat. Oh, thank so you. So you need to move. So, no. I mean, you're welcome. But in the meantime, how can people stay in touch with you? Obviously, I highly recommend the Twitters. It's a great way to stay, uh, get involved. If you have yeah, the interviews, sure. Miss Susanna, I would highly recommend checking her Twitter. Get you up to date. I'm just saying. It yeah, does. and I'm not like an obnoxious Twitter who like, no. uh, I don't do like the 325 a.m. Twitter fashion people. I don't do that. That's me. That's but what I, do. I also don't do like 10 Twitters a day. I try to, uh, 10 tweets, tweets a day. I try <laughs> to, um, yeah, I try to uh, keep my tweets to more of a relevant uh, every now and then tweet. Yeah, it's specific to the office, and, and it not, lets you know uh, what's actually happening. I also have really my own is. Twitter feed, though, Susanna A. Mendoza. That was before. Remember, that's how you, you would follow me before I was elected. But we also have the Illinois Comptroller. Oh, this um, is the official Twitter. We have an Twitter. official Twitter page. This is why Illinois I know Comptroller. so much. There were two, there were two tweeting yes. handles. And that's like, regardless of whether I'm the controller or there's another controller in the future, uh, people change their mind about me and go for someone else, right? This is a democracy. But my point is, whoever the next controller is, whether it's me or someone else, it's always going to be the Illinois controller. Uh, hashtag, you know, like a username like for Twitter. Exactly. And we're trying to, like, just, you know, professionalize the office. And then also uh, I have mine, which is Susanna, S-U-S-A-N-A. A-N-A, one A. Uh-huh, one, yes. And two A's and one N. One N. Yes, that's right. We can cut, we can cut. I do that. know math. So, uh, Susanna two, A. Two Mendoza. N's. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, follow me on that, please. And, uh, and, you know, go ahead and tweet and retweet my stuff and uh, help me out here and there. Throw me a bone. I mean, come on. You need all the help you can get, and it's not because you're not doing a great job with what it is that you have, but it does seem like...
This needs to come to the fore. People understand what the ramifications of not having a budget is so we can get one soon. Yeah, and like, get out of your house and like, go to a rally or something. Let's mobilize, you know? Let's rise up in a peaceful and nonviolent way. But like, I was at that women's march. I didn't tell you I had pneumonia for a whole week. I heard about this. Yeah, and then I just gathered up enough strength to make it out to that women's march. It was the first day out of the house for me after the pneumonia Good Lord. on Saturday. And it was awesome to be a part of that, right? I mean, it was so great. And it was just like, wow, look at these numbers of people. And everybody had a good time. And it was like a positive thing. And we should be doing a lot more of that. It was awesome to see all those people at the airport the other day, too. That was amazing. That was so cool. I just feel like... In, you know, I'm 44 years old now, but I don't remember ever b- having a period of time <laughs> where, um, that's because you've been drinking, but I don't remember a period of time where we've had this much kind of like active mobility of the masses in such a short span of time. So it's, you know, because really, terrible things are happening in our country, but at the same time, what's not terrible is that people are mobilizing for yeah. causes they believe in, and that's awesome. That's what blew my doors off about the airport, is that in a matter, matter of hours. High five, man. That was, mm, yeah. <sighs> Um, well, you know, just for future reference, you know what helps with pneumonia? A little old fashioned. Hot toddies or something? Yeah. Hot toddy, that's cold right. toddy. It's regular toddy. And I was knocked out. It was not good. You were sick for yeah. like a week, right? I was. I was like a walking, coughing, nasty thing. It, it was bad. But look, I'm great now. You should have went to visit the governor then. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll watch the Twitter, we'll read the paper. We'll stay engaged, and we'll try to get people mobilized to yeah. try to do something about this. Um, I Everybody get to... help by tweeting the governor right now and telling him, Article 8, Section 2 of the Constitution of Illinois says it is your responsibility, not the General Assembly's, to introduce a balanced budget. Get to work. So just say that again. <laughs> No, Are you going to do it right kidding. now? No, I'm That's on airplane awesome. mode, yeah. so my, uh, so my yeah. battery doesn't die. Hey. Look at this camera and say, we'll put that at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. You're going to stick around. We're going to do a little Instagram live Okay, you got it. Uh, we're going to cheers one time and do a happy send-off. Okay, thanks. Uh, Comptroller Mendoza, thank you so much for joining me here at Seven Wolf Theater Company for a happy hour. I hope you had a happy hour. It was awesome. Yes, very Excellent. happy. Oh, were we? Pra- I thought we were practicing. No? Let's do it again. One more time. Sorry. I thought he was walking me through it. Okay, go.